So some thoughts about the future of, future of visualization. In the past few months, there have been several conferences that have been talking about what the future of visualization would be. One of them is obviously Tapestry, which has the word storytelling in its own title, all right? So storytelling is part of the future of a visualization. And as a journalist, you may know or you may foresee that I am very concerned and I am very interested as well about storytelling. Storytelling is part of my life. Storytelling is part of my job. I don't consider myself an academic, by the way, if you want to correct that into the pre previous presentation and on the data. I don't consider myself an academic. I am a professor, but I am a journalist first. So I read a lot about journalism. I write about journalism. And all the things that I'm going to share today are somehow related to journalism. And the things that I'm going to say about the future of visualization are somehow permeated by that view, all right? So everything is going to be related to storytelling, or visualization for storytelling, but visualization for journalism, so news visualization. So storytelling is important for us, okay? I believe that storytelling appeals to humans uh, in general because, and it is powerful as a tool for communicating, just because the human brain somehow has been designed by a, a natural selection, by evolution, to like stories. So our memory, our memory somehow organized, some certain points of, certain parts of our memory are somehow organized in a way that matches how stories work, all right? So we gather information from the world, we have memories, and our brain stores those memories somehow in a sequ sequential a, a manner. And it, uh, it, uh, later on, it recovers those memories also in a sequential manner, all right? Not only episodic memory, which is what I'm, I'm, I'm showing over there, but also semantic memory. Semantic memory is also somehow organized as a story. So storytelling somehow appeals to us because it also appeals to how the human brain is somehow organized when we consciously or unconsciously store, uh, store memories. Uh, so storytelling can be very powerful uh, for that, but is storytelling the only future or the most important thing in the, in the future of a visualization? I don't believe that it is, okay? And I'm going to explain why in a minute. So we have visualization on, on our table right now. Now, another conference, another very recent conference, uh, Visualize 2014, proposed a different thing for the future of visualization, or a different key for the future of visualization. And I'm going to quote Francis Gagnon, who is in the audience right now, who wrote a very, very nice post summarizing what the Visualize conference was. He says, well, it took place in New York City a while ago, and it was about storytelling also, uh, and it was, they talk a lot about storytelling, likely because no one defi defined the term, but yet it seemed like the true theme of the conference, the one to which every speaker was bringing a perspective was the same, how to make complexity comfortable, all right? So complexity may also be part of the future. And, you know, I agree with that idea. I agree that the increasing complexi complexity of the world, the deluge of data, it's somehow a challenge that we need to meet through visualization or via or by means of using a, a visualization. It's a major challenge today. It was a major challenge 20 years ago, and it's a, even a larger challenge today, just because we are surrounded, we are surrounded by data. But should be dealing with complexity our core goal or our core value in visualization or is a key for the future? It, it is a key for the future, but is it the only one? That's another question that I have. Very recently, a Enrico Bertini wrote about another conference that he attended, and I'm going to quote him as well. So a, in one of his latest posts, he mentioned that he attended the Eight Data Conference, and Enrico was surprised by what political and social scientists would like to see in a visualization compared to what we are creating for them. So Enrico wrote a summary of his impressions, and he said, I'm quoting here, he said, it's stunning for me to see how most of our visualization projects are organized around the detection and depiction of trends, patterns, outliers, groupings, and, to sel and so seldom around causation, causation. Yet in most scientific endeavors, causal relationships is what matters the most. Okay, so we have like three different concepts or three different ideas that are somehow related to the future of visualization. We have storytelling, we have complexity, we have revealing causation, perhaps we can have more. 
But the question that I have for you, and perhaps it is something that we can discuss over, over lunch, is if you will really believe that these are the keys for the future in visualization. And the question that I have for you, and I wrote it down so I can remember it, is isn't complexity just a challenge, storytelling just a means to deal with that challenge, and revealing causation one of the possible results of meeting that challenge. Because if that is true, none of those things is the key for the future of visualization for communicating with general audiences. It's something else related to that, that ties all that together. As major goals of, for the future of visualization, I believe that these three things are a little bit too narrow. They are part of the future of visualization, but they are not the key for the success, for the future success of visualization. So what should be the ultimate goal of visualization for communication with general audiences? Remember that I am talking a little bit like a journalist here, okay? I'm not talking about scientific visualization. I'm not talking about visualization for business, internal communication in the corporate world. I'm talking about visualization for communication. To give you an answer uh, to that question, I need to talk a little bit about what I'm working on at the moment. All of you know that I wrote that book in 2012. I am bored of talking about it, so I'm not going to discuss it anymore. <laughs> uh, but what some of you probably don't know is that I'm writing a new book that eventually, crossing my fingers here, it will be published in 2015. And the working title of that book is The Insightful Art. And that is the dummy copy. Kim Reese, by the way, doesn't know that I'm planning to use her graphic in the book cover. <laughs> And there is a blurb by Stephen Few in there. He doesn't know that he's going to write that blurb there. <laughs> uh, he actually sent me an email the other day saying, thank you for writing the blurb for me. Uh, but so I'm very persuasive. He will write that. All right, so what I would like to tell you is what the book is about, how the book is going to be is structured. Because the way the book is structured will define or defines what I think the future of visualization for communication will be. So there will be some spoilers ahead, ahead. I'm not going to describe what that silly joke means. But anyway, the features that define visualization, forget about that slide, okay? Uh, the features that define a, 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 the future of visualization for communication, in my opinion, are these ones. The future that defines visualization, and also the features that define great information graphics. That is interrelated. The first feature that defines a great information graphic or a great visualization for communication is that all visualizations need to be truthful. I do believe that as communicators, we need to be humble enough to drop the word truth. That is a very dangerous word. No one knows what the truth is. That is impossible to know. Not even the, the largest or the most important genius in humankind know, knows what the truth is. But what we can do and what we should do and what we must strive to do is to be truthful. And to be truthful means to convey our best understanding of what the truth is or our, be our best understanding of what the most probable truth is. That is what being truthful is. It's a very, very, it's a cherished value in, in, in journalism, obviously. So this is smaller truth. It's not what you would like the truth to be. It is not what benefits your clients or your employers. It is not what can help you advance your political ideas, okay? It is not any of that. It is your best understanding of the truth. That's what truthful means, in my opinion, your best understanding of the truth. Second value that visualization for communication needs to respect is functionality. Purpose, thinking about purpose, all right? So the visual shapes that you choose to encode your data, to make your data visible or understandable, should not depend on your personal aesthetic choices alone. That's an important factor, but it is not the only one or even the most important one. The way you choose, the way you choose graphic forms, the choice of shapes to encode your data should be tied to the tasks you predict your audience will try to accomplish, okay? By seeing your visualization, by the messages that you want your audience to extract, okay? As a tool to gain knowledge. As you know, in my opinion, a visualization is above all a tool for understanding, right? In particular, a, a visualization for communication. So functionality, purpose, function, doesn't dictate the form, 
but function constraints, the variety of forms that your graphic can adopt. Okay? Then you have some freedom within those constraints. And I believe that many designers don't understand this idea, which in my opinion is pure and simple common sense. It's a no-brainer. Third value is beauty. Creating graphics that are beautiful, that are attractive, that are surprising, that are exciting, is also a value that we should pursue. And I know that beauty is a you know, slippery, subjective term. It depends on the audience. It depends on the context, etc. But it's a value that we should pursue. We should try to create graphics that are beautiful, okay, and attractive and elegant, depending on, depending on the audience. There is some evidence out there, and there are some writings out there that basically say that something that looks great usually works better. So there is a connection between the external beauty of an object and how functional that object is. We could say, you know, how, how much I like recommending books. So here goes our book recommendation. Emotional Design by Donald Norman basically describes that. A beautiful object usually works better. So beauty is another value that we should, that we should pursue and that we should respect. The next future or the next value that uh, we should pursue is something that I believe many designers overlook, but it's a very important one. Any great infographic or any great visualization, and this is key for the future of visualization, should be insightful. I see many graphics, beautiful, wonderful looking graphics out there that tell me nothing. I don't get anything from them. They are wonderful, they are great, they are beautiful, they are attractive, they make me stop and take a look at them, but then I don't extract any meaningful or valuable message from them, all right? So a great infographic should not just throw data at you, all right? It should point out what is important in the data, what is interesting in the data, what is surprising in the data, what are the most relevant stories in the data. That is what insightful means. And to do that, in many cases, you have to guide the reader by the hand by understand, to understand what the story that you're trying to present, helping readers figure out what the story, what the important stories are. So right now we have four different features or four different values that I believe are important for the, um, for the future of visualization. The last one is the one that I believe is the key for the future of visualization, because when you create a graphic that is based on your best understanding of the truth, when you create a graphic that you know, is adapted, its shape is adapted to the purpose that the graphic has, it is functional. A graphic that is beautiful attracts your audience to the display that you are creating. And it is insightful because it reveals truths or reveals realities that people would not see otherwise. You would, cre you would be creating a graphic that will be enlightening. And that is the word that I believe that defines or should define the future of visualization. Your graphic will change my mind for the better. That is the key for visualization. It will increase the knowledge that I have about a particular topic, a particular relevant topic. It will tell me something relevant about the world, and it will change my mind for the better. So at their core, e-visualization and information graphics should always be about increasing understanding. That is the key for the future. Embracing these ideals, in my opinion, is what will define the future, the success of visualization for communication in the future. Much more than technical innovation, much more than working with the greatest you know, tools out there, programming languages, I love all that, I'm learning how to use D3, I was so excited the other day that I even wrote about it. All right? I don't give a damn about tools. What is really key here is helping people understand, helping people, helping citizens, all right, our fellow citizens, citizens understand what the reality is. So truthful, let me talk about each one of them, each one of those very, very quickly, being truthful. Many graphics out there lie, and we love to laugh about them, right? There are several websites out there that actually laugh at them, right? And we all love them, all right? They are great fun, you know, and they play a very important role in our, in our community. Those are graphics that I usually show in my classes, students love them, that is a comparison of the election results in Venezuela, that's 50 versus 49%, but take a look at the bars. Below you have Fox News, I'm not, going, I'm not going to get into that. I don't usually talk about politics in my presentations. But in my opinion, these are very easy targets. And we are focusing too much 
on these easy targets. And we are forgetting about the not so easy targets, which are even more important uh, rela in relationship uh, to making visualization more truthful. I'm going to show you a chart that, pardon my French, scares the shit out of me. It's going to be included in the introduction to the insightful art. It's going to be the first graphic in the prologue to the, the book that I am writing. And it compares the rise of PR and marketing professionals uh, per 100,000 people versus the drop in the amount of journalists in the, drop market, in, the, sorry, in the job market right now. It is a graphic that I redesigned based on another chart shown in that book, The Death and Life of American Journalism. That is another book recommendation, by the way. It's a very interesting book. And obviously, you can argue that most PR and marketing professionals don't want to lie. They, are, they try to be honest. And many journalists do lie. But at the same time, you know, massaging the data is in the DNA of PR, and it is not in the DNA in journalism, all right? Or it should not be, at least. It should not be, at least, in the definition of journalism. Let me show you a definition of PR. I know that this is going to be a little bit controversial with PR people, but when you look for a definitions of what PR is about, this is what PR is about. PR, one of the rules of PR is never deceive the public, but present the facts in a way that sheds as much positive light on your company as possible. I believe that this is a contradiction. This is a complete contradiction. And I actually, you can call me a cynic if you want, but I believe that this definition needs to be rewritten. I am an editor, so whenever I see a sentence like this, I feel prompted to rewrite it and to actually get rid of that contradiction. So this is how I would rewrite that sentence. Never deceive the public unless you cannot present the facts in a way that sheds as much positive light in your company as possible. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I believe that this is actually true, all right? And this worries me a lot. Now, when I'm talking about PR, by the way, I'm not talking just about people who formally call themselves PR professionals. I am also talking about those visualization designers and those information graphics designers who try to do graphics for good or data for good or visualization for social change. Those are very valuable uh, values, but I believe that there is risk in that. Right? I'm going to describe what the risk may be. So visualization designers and communicators that call themselves activists, okay? Activists, that is the world. People, people who want to advance certain causes that they consider just. And I agree with many of those, those causes beforehand, okay? So those folks are doing PR and marketing to advance those causes, all right? Visualization for social change is becoming some sort of a buzzword, like storytelling, all right? Like storytelling for visualization. And what worries me nowadays is that I believe that some people in visualization, some people in visualization seem to be advocating that we should embrace our biases and strengthening our biases, political, social, cultural biases, rather than fighting against those biases. And you may think that I am being a little bit too extreme in this opinion, but I don't, I don't believe that I am, all right? Very recently, I came across an article written by an infographics designer from India who very, very clearly expressed this goal. And you can read about it in my website. The link is over there, so when you get access to the slides, you will be able to read the whole article. So uh, this is the quote. This is a quote from the, from the article. He said, the thought starts when you're creating an infographic with the message and then gets into putting other related information together to support it instead of starting with the data and thinking of what to make of it, the message. The advantage of taking this route is also that you are not just restricted by topics or numbers or just presenting news. You can go a step further and air your views to make a point. This is horrendous. 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 And we should fight against this trend whenever we see it. You should never begin or should not begin with an idea and then just look for the data that confirms that idea. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. That is not how reason, how rational 
thinking works. The way it works is that you may think for the data that confirms your idea, but you have to make yourself, you have to force yourself to look for the data that potentially could disprove your cherished hypothesis or your cherished ideas. All right? In, and if those data contradict what you think, you need to be ready to drop those ideas or at least change them. That is the danger of visualization for social change. As much as I respect that idea, and I believe that there's a lot of value in there. All right? So we need to fight against this practice. This guy, this person, and he's a good designer, don't get me wrong, his designs are beautiful, all right? He's not acting as an evidence-driven communicator, as a truth teller. He's acting as an activist, someone who shapes the data in a way that pushes your values, and that is completely wrong, in my opinion. So this is about people who actively and consciously, consciously do this. But there is also danger on or about doing this unconsciously. I don't know if you are familiar with that famous saying by a Richard Feynman, the first principle in science, but we could apply this to journalism, to visualization design, or to any other evidence-driven uh, evidence endeavor or job. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool, always. Uh, in journalism, we have this saying, I remember when I attended journalism school many, many years ago, I'm getting older very quickly, um, that uh, some, many of my professors used to say, trust your instincts. Don't. Don't trust your instincts. Never do that. Your instincts are usually wrong. Or at least, trust them in the same way that you would trust any other source. You always double check your sources, or at least you try to. Sometimes you cannot, because you don't have access to other sources, to contrast the data. But if you do have access to those sources, you, you, know, you double check your data. Same thing with your instincts, okay? Same thing with your principles. We should fight against your instincts or our instincts with reason and with logic and with common sense as well. And we need to develop, there is, a, there is a, a, a word that I like to mention in my latest presentations, we need to develop what Kaiser Funk, who runs the, runs the Junk Charts a blog, and I recommend that as well, he wrote a book recently called Number Sense. I believe that we need to develop a better number sense. We need to be acquainted with science, we need to learn about stats, we need to learn about evidence in general. And we should double check our intuitions. Intuition, following intuitions is not a good idea. Let me refer to history. Let me refer, talk about history to illustrate this idea. Yesterday, during the cocktail, most of you uh, saw me wearing a t-shirt with that infographic on it. This is my favorite infographic ever. The problem, this obviously this was done by John Snow in the 19th century. I'm not going to go into the detail to show that uh, during a cholera outbreak, you could uh, map the amount of cases of cholera or deaths of cholera in a particular region, and you will end up seeing that you know, most of the deaths in this particular outbreak are clustered around a water pump, okay? John Snow was trying to show the connection between drinking contaminated water and getting cholera. That's what, what he was trying to do. This story is much more complicated than that, obviously. But this story, the story of this map, has been often mistold because everybody focuses everybody focuses on how beautiful it is how wonderful it is and how clearly it displays the clustering of deaths around the water pump all right but the thing what what makes this graphic wonderful is not that john snow focused on the data that proved his hypothesis because there are many exceptions in the data there were people who died but who lived far away from the water pump. And there were a lot of people who lived very close to the water pump, and they didn't die. All right, those are the data that could potentially disprove his hypothesis. And he worked like a data journalism. He actively forced himself to go to those houses, knock on the door, and find out why those people had died, even if they lived a mile away from the water pump. And he also went to the houses in which no deaths were recorded, like that one there in the middle, knocked on the door and discovered that that building in which no deaths were recorded was a brewery. So people over there didn't drink water. They drank the, spirit, drank the spirits that they produced. 
So that's what we need to do in visualization, not just focus on the data that advance our causes, but on the data that can disprove also our causes. That is the danger, I believe, in trying to become activists. I don't have anything about activism as long as first you are a truth teller. I, li I like that word. Try to be a truth teller first before you become an activist. So by all means, do good with data. I love that motto. I love periscopic's work. But I do believe that if an activist for causes uh, needs also to pay attention to, il uh, to all these ideas. And as I said before, if by being truthful, by exploring the data and seeing the data that could potentially disprove what you're trying to tell, you discover evidence that contradicts even if your most you know, loved or cherished ideals, you need to be open-minded enough to drop them or to at least change them. Be open-minded enough to do that. Now, a little bit about the relationship between functionality or purpose and beauty. I'm not going to bore you with a description of how to choose graphic forms. You already know all about that. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is to talk a little bit about uh, the topic of creativity. I know that many people in this room and many people in visualization nowadays are very, interesting, very interested in, in visualization, in creativity, in visualization, using new graphic forms, you know, pushing the boundaries a little bit in terms of what is acceptable, etc. And, um, and that is great. I believe that there's a lot of value in that. But my message in this part of the presentation is actually a contradiction because I would like to say embrace creativity but at the same time be highly skeptical of creativity. That is the message that I would like to leave on the table. Now, first of all, in favor of creativity. Creativity uh, plays a huge role in visualization. All right, that's William Playfer's work. I don't need to explain who, who that guy is. But I usually joke in my presentations, particularly the way I'm, when I'm talking to journalists, to writers, I usually say that William, if William Playfer had lived today instead of on, in the 18th century, and if he had worked in a news environment, in a newsroom, he would never have invented statistical charts because he would have faced the skepticism of writers, of editors, who usually tell me, tell you, and would tell William Playfer, that is too complicated for our readers. Our readers are not used to seeing these very complex charts, all right? They will be scared uh, for the, from, uh, uh, by this graphic. Let's just do a table, let's just do a spreadsheet, let's them see the numbers, don't just create this crazy looking graphic form. That is too complex. They will not know how to read that. That is pure crap, as we all know. But we still face that kind of skepticism in newsrooms nowadays. And that is, has to do with the fact that news editors are one of the most reactionary species that I have ever met. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to speak at NICAR in a couple of days, and I'm going to actually say the same thing. I believe that it's not going to be so welcome as I'm being today. So that said, so there is value in pushing the boundaries and in trying to create new graphic forms and exploring new ideas. But I do believe, though, that too many visualization designers are too much focused on being creative rather than on being clear. There is also a lot of risk on that. I'm going to show you a quote that I got recently from a presentation by Mike Montero, who is a designer in, in, in San Francisco. Uh, we need to fear the consequences of our work more than we love the cleverness of our ideas. There is a lot, a lot of value in this sentence. There is a lot of wisdom in this sentence. Fear your creativity. Be careful, be wary of your creativity. I have been recently accused, by the way, by a few friends, friendly accused, of a, you know, attacking a straw man when I say that many designers put their personal aesthetic preferences before their obligation to serve the public by being clear. And I disagree. I will have to disagree with that. Because having worked in newsrooms with many designers in newsrooms, I have seen throughout the years that the following, the following attitude or the following, f following philosophy or the following sentences, I heard the following sentences. Oh, I like this new cool graphic form. I have seen this beautiful radar graph by I don't know, Fernanda Viegas. Let's use this one over here without, you know, sorry, Fernanda. Hey, I don't know that you don't use radar graphs, but let, all right, 
by accurate, right? Let's use this graphic form, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without caring or without paying attention if that is the appropriate graphic form in that particular context, all right? To be clear, to convey the idea clear. Or I like, you know, I like this font. Let's use this font. Or I like this color palette. Let's use this color palette. Rather than thinking if, if that graphic form, color palette, type choices uh, fit the purposes of the visualization, fit the tasks that graphic should facilitate, all right? And I'm going to give you an example. Let me tell you beforehand, I'm sorry, Kat, but I believe that I'm going to show something from the Washington Post. I'm going to criticize your work a little bit. Sorry about that. I am a fan of the Washington Post work. That, that's something that I have to say beforehand. But I do believe that this graphic over here illustrates this idea very well. I don't know if you have seen it already. I'm going to visit the graphic here. This graphic, I believe, illustrates that some designers sometimes they get their priorities wrong. So are the Winter Olympics uh, for the rich is a graphic that displays different countries in the form of little circles. Uh, the purple ones are rich countries and the green ones are poor countries. And if you see a little dot in the middle, that means that that country won medals in the, uh, in the, in the Olympics, all right? And the whole goal of the graphic is to let you see, in theory, that rich countries are more likely to win medals than poor countries. And the graphic is a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. Take a look at that. It moves around, you know, it's bubbly, there you go, it moves away, etc., etc., etc. It's fun and it's joyful and I cannot understand anything. I cannot see trends and patterns here. I cannot even see the core message of the graphic. I don't see it. So what about if after, if after having fun with the moving bubbles and the circles circling around, etc., after that, after you show me how capable you are at using D3 or processing or whatever it was used to create this beautiful graphic, after you show me the, bu the bubbles uh, moving around, do you actually cluster the bubbles that way? I did that in Illustrator in just five minutes. It only takes a couple of minutes to do that, right? And it's much more clear. It's much clearer. It lets you see the proportions between rich countries, poor countries, and how many, way, how many of them won medals. Obviously, this could be better done, obviously, but it illustrates my idea a, a quite well in my opinion. Any innovation, any innovation should happen within certain constraints that are defined or that are, you know, created, let's say, by, you know, how the human visual perception and cognition system works, all right? The previous thing is hard to see, it's hard to understand, it's hard to extract meaning from that graphic. It's beautiful, it's fun. It's great, it attracts my attention. But then after that, it frustrates me because it doesn't let me see the message. I like to reason or I like to, I like to put analogies, to create analogies to illustrate what I am trying to say. And I'm going to show you my favorite book in 2013, all right? The, the best book that I read in 2013 is A.C. Grayling's The God Argument, which is not, by the way, a rant against a religion. It's a book about humanism. And that is one of the most wonderful paragraphs in that book, all right? And I'm going to read it, just because I believe it's beautiful. It has nothing to do with the topic of the presentation, but let me make a parenthesis. <laughs> humanism is above all about living thoughtfully and intelligent intelligently, about rising to the demand to be informed, alert, and responsive about being able to make a sound case for a choice of values and goals, and about integrity in living according to the former and determination in seeking to achieve the latter. Actually, it is very closely related to the topic of this talk, but anyway. What would a creative designer do with a sentence like that? Because this makes the message transparent, accessible, easy to read, and extremely clear. Now think what a creative designer would do that, with that to make this presentation much more interesting. That is the equivalent of creating a highly creative graphic form. But the problem is that a display like this, as ex I know that it's an extreme example, but anyway, it makes my point, makes my case, it brings attention to itself rather than bringing attention to the message, okay? It is making, extracting the message much harder all right, just for the sake of making the presentation more attractive. And those things need to be balanced out correctly. I know how hard that can be, but we should strive to balance out the clarity of the presentation with the attractiveness of the presentation or the creativity. Or creativity, is that a word? It's not a word. But uh, with the creativity of the presentation. 
It, my students sometimes, by the way, they accuse me of you know, trying to curb their creative impulses. When I do, uh, Kat knows that, and, and, any, and I don't know if there's another student of mine here. I, yeah, all right, there are more students over here. And probably some of them are watching me today. Uh, they, are accused, they are accusing me, or they accuse me, of curbing their creative impulses. So when we have a project, they came to me with crazy radar graphs and you know, strange maps and stuff that are extremely creative and extremely beautiful. And I tell them, why don't you use a bar graph? I know that many, he many people here don't like bar graphs, but bar graphs are wonderful. Or a dot plot, or a lollipop graph, or a scatter plot, or just a more traditional graphic form. Those can be extremely beautiful, and it will be extremely clear. I usually call that the Picasso approach to innovation in visualization, okay? And I'm going to explain what that is. When we talk about Picasso, if you don't know a lot about art, what many, or even if you do, what many people know about Picasso is a lot about the latest work by Picasso, the abstract and cubist periods of, of Picasso. But what many people, the most creative, a part of his, a, a, of his work. But what many people don't remember is that before becoming one of the people who pushed the boundaries of art, he was an extremely talented, figurative artist. All right, let me go there, back there. An extremely talented, figurative artist, all right? So before, I'm actually planning to write a chapter for the insightful art that probably will be called, You Cannot Be a Mandolin Player Before Being an Old Fisherman. First of all, being an old fisherman, and after that, you can become a mandolin player. Meaning, first of all, work with traditional graphic forms, all right? Be become very familiar with traditional bulletproof graphic forms, and then start pushing the boundaries. That is the message that I try to convey to my students. Learn how to use graphic forms, traditional graphic forms, really well, and then venture to create new graphic forms if you want to. And even when you use a no, not so traditional graphic form, and I'm going to show you an example from the New York Times. This is a wonderful interactive visualization from the New York Times showing how people in the US spend uh, their day, all right? Working or you know, sleeping or doing other things, all right? That I'm not going to mention today. So it's a stacked line graph. It's an area graph, right? Now, this is a great graphic form. This could be the equivalent of a string graph. For instance, string graphs are very creative and very innovative, but they are only good at showing you the overall picture, the big picture. They are not that great at show at letting you compare within each one of those variables, the change of each one of those variables. So the wonderful thing about uh, uh, this visualization by the New York Times is that it is not limited to just one graphic form. All right, and this is going to be one of the main messages in the book that I am writing right now. If you are going to do interactive visualization based on D3 or processing, whatever, there is not a reason why you don't let me see the, the data from multiple angles by different graphic forms. So what did the New York Times designers did in this wonderful, amazing visualization? I cannot see, for instance, work. What about if I am interested in seeing how work changes throughout the day? That is really difficult to see because the baseline of the uh, band that defines work is shifting all the time. So the vis this visualization lets you click on any of those categories or, or any of those values, and that part of the visualization will drop to the zero baseline to let you see the change on that particular value. Different graphic forms for different purposes. First graphic form gives you the overall picture, Ben Schneiderman is somewhere, all right, this connects to his ideas of, you know, first of all, provide the overall picture, then let me zoom in and let me explore the data. It's related to that. Different graphic forms for different purposes, okay? This graphic illustrates that idea very well. So even if you're going to create something extremely creative, give me at least one button that lets me see that as a bar graph or as a line graph or as a, you know, map, okay? Because probably I am old-fashioned and I'm getting older by the day, I would like to see the data, first of all, in the beautiful visual visualization, creative visualization, but then in a more traditional graphic form, if possible. To illustrate this idea further, I would like to show you a project by students, students from the University of Wisconsin, rather the students of cartography from the University of Wisconsin, 
It's a project called 50 Years of Change, and it shows how uh, laws related to uh, uh, gay rights have changed throughout the years in the United States. I'm not going to go over that project. I'm just going to leave the recommendation on the table. It's 50yearsofchange.com. Visit it when you can. And you will see that the same data, the same data set, is represented multiple times on a map, on a bar graph, on a timeline, it's exactly the same data, number of laws, either in favor or against gay people in the United States. Each one of those graphic forms is letting you do something entirely different with the data. So it is beautiful, it is insightful, it is attractive, all right? And at the same time, it lets me explore the data. Insightful. The idea that, the idea of what insightful means is that it, it you know, when we create a graphic, we should not just show the obvious, all right? If we want to do that, just write a headline. If you just want to display the obvious in the data set. What we should show in a graphic, though, or at least highlight in some way, is the unexpected, the counterintuitive, the surprising, the informative, all right? It's not creating a visualization. Creating a visualization is not just throwing data at readers. You can show readers the entire complexity of a data set if you want to. That is perfectly acceptable, and I love that, when you let me explore all the data set and I can see it and stuff. But at least first, point out what is interesting in the data. Show me what I should look for, and then let me explore, all right? The New York Times people, again, call that the annotation layer. I believe that is extremely important in information graphics, annotating your graphics somehow. Remember that I'm talking about graphics for communicating with general audiences, okay? Unfortunately, unfortunately, in my opinion, many beautiful visualizations nowadays are not particularly insightful, unless that you go to them with some previous knowledge, okay? Before I show you some of them, by the way, let me tell you in advance that I believe that they are wonderful, all right? I'm criticizing some people's work. Let me tell you that every graphic that I have sh uh, seen so far, I believe that they are great, okay? They are great. These graphics that I'm going to show you probably are the, uh, are the cutting edge in terms of using technology, but there is a, that important component is missing on them. So this is by Eric Fisher, Language Communities on Twitter. And when I saw it for the first time, I thought that it was an amazing piece of visualization. I saw it and I wanted to print it and put it on my office wall just because it's so, it's so amazing. But when you start reading it, you will see that it's not particularly insightful, all right? Because I, as I mentioned in, my, in, my, in, in some uh, recent lectures, I already know that people in Spain tweet in Spanish. I don't need a visualization for that or that people in Russia tweet in Russian. That is not particularly insightful. So there is a key component missing here, which is to highlight the exceptions, to highlight the interesting stories. For instance, as a reader, I'm asking that as a reader, not as a visualization designer. Who are those people in the middle of France who are not tweeting in French? I want to know who those are. That's, interesting. This, that's an interesting story. Tell that to me. Annotate your graphic. Put a number in there, write a piece of text underneath the graphic telling me there are certain communities in the middle of France who emigrated from Italy in the 19th century. I'm, I'm making this up, by the way. This is not history. All right? <laughs> this is not truthful. All right? I'm making this up. But that's the kind of thing that we should strive for. Do some editorial work. All right? Let the editorial voice get into the visualization somehow by highlighting what is interesting or relevant in the data. There are many visualizations out there, by the way, who, that also push the boundaries in terms of complexity and beauty, but again, they are not particularly insightful because they are, just, they are overwhelming. This is an example of overwhelming visualization by Google. It's an amazing piece of work. I love it. And I navigated it for probably 30 minutes or something like that, just trying to extract meaning. But I am not a, I, I was not trying to make a joke. I actually did that. <laughs> If this visualization overwhelms me, a professional of visualization who used to seeing graphics every single day, try to think about what would happen with a regular reader. They will just take a look at this for 10 seconds and move out, just because they will not be able to see anything in the, in the data. Probably I'm not the right audience for this kind of graphic, perhaps. It overwhelms me. Or this one by Ben Fry, which is wonderful. It's an amazing piece of work, but it's probably just a population density map. When, when I criticize these beautiful examples, by the way, I am usually accused, and I'm quoting here, 
because I have heard these accusations several times. I'm told that I am missing the point, in, and I agree. I, I don't get the point <laughs> of, of, this, of these graphics. What, what's the point exactly? I need the annotation layer. I need the annotation layer. Jeff, jokes come later. Uh, now, why investing so much energy in creating something as wonderful and beautiful uh, as this one, if after that the graphic is going to be, I would not say useless, but it is useless for me because I don't get the idea. I don't get the message that you are trying to tell, okay? As I grow older, as I grow older, visualizations that are honest and simple and useful become more interesting for me. And this is a good example of what I'm trying to say. I'm becoming more impatient. I want things that are useful, and this is a good example by the Wall Street Journal, all right? These are the kinds of visualizations that impress me the most, okay? They are not the ones that use, you know, that are at the cutting edge of technology, that use D3 in a very innovative way, or that show how wonderfully skilled you are at using processing. As I said before, I don't give a damn about how skilled you are at using Python or whatever. Instead, the visualizations that impress me the most are these ones. They are windows through which I can see or I can envision or I can grasp what those, da those data that you're trying to present mean. This is simple. It's a simple visualization, but it is not simplistic at all. Not simplistic at all. all right? It's engaging and it is fun to navigate, and at the same time, it is also, I mean, it's beautiful in its dry, very dry way, but it is beautiful and elegant anyway. But it is useful, and that is the key word. So, as I said before, when you try to create something that it is truthful, beautiful, and a, a enlightening, and functional, etc., you will end up also creating something that perhaps will be enlightening in the sense of changing people's minds for, for the better. Actually, you are seeing that I'm using Jon Snow's a, a map a, in every single a opening slide of my presentation. Just believe it, it illustrates these values very well, right? It's a truthful visualization, just because he did a lot of data analysis work in order to find out if his hypothesis was right or wrong. And after that, it's also functional, because you can see the patterns and the trends in the data. It is also beautiful in its own strange way, but it is beautiful and appealing. It's intriguing. It's attractive, even if it's not the best piece of design out there. And it is insightful because it lets you access the complexity of the data, and it changes your mind for the better. If you lived in the 19th century and you see this graphic for the first time and you know that it's trying to show the connection between water and cholera, perhaps it will not change your mind, but it will make you think. It will make you think very deeply about the topic that you are trying to present. It has the potential to change your understanding of a very relevant topic. So to end this presentation, I would like to uh, show you a little bit more about the uh, a, a talk uh, by Mike Montero that I mentioned before. Because after he gave that talk, I wrote a blog post in which I praised that presentation. And I also mentioned the book that was inspiring him. The name of that book, the title of that book is Design for the Real World. And that is another book recommendation for you today. If you have not read it yet, go ahead and read it. It's a book about industrial design. It was written many years ago, back in the 60s. But I believe that many of the ideas contained in that book are still applicable today. When I wrote about Mike's presentation and that, that book uh, as an extension of that, I wrote the following paragraph. Our first responsibility is towards the planet, humankind, citizens, and only after that, towards clients and employers, or even towards your artsy inner world, okay? You must be a creator of devices that make this earth a better place before you can even think of becoming a fine artist. I do believe that that is the key for the success in the future for the field that we all call visualization. Anyway. Thank you so much. It has been an honor to share all these ideas with you. <laughs> Do we need a microphone for that or? Uh, all right, perhaps we can use this one. All right, okay, go ahead.
I, I mean, uh, I was actually talking with uh, Robert, a, a Emperor Ming evil a man, <laughs> uh, during breakfast exactly about that. He's conducting several research projects about how people perceive different kinds of visualization. So there's a lot of research to be done. The way you choose graphic forms is to base of all, first of all, you know, you should get a good understanding of cognitive psychology because there are certain things that psychology has already shown that it, they work and they don't work, okay? At the same time, there is a lot of guesswork involved. Uh, as research progresses and changes and improves, we will get better ideas of how to choose graphic forms appropriately. But I do believe that, for example, William Cleveland's and Robert McGill's scale of uh, graphic forms that Naomi Robbins described in her book, and I also show in my book, I can show that to you later if you want to, are still a good starting point to choose graphic forms. So we do believe that, for instance, we do believe, no, we do know that graphic forms that are based on a zero, common zero baseline, are much better at letting you compare values than bubble plots or maps, et cetera. We do know that. That has been shown by, by research. So you can base your decisions uh, in terms of choosing graphic forms on that kind of research. It's only that the research is incomplete so far. It needs to progress further. It's a lot of guesswork in some cases. Any other question? Yes. Ben himself, ben himself uh, can call that data art, but there are many people in our community who call that data visualization, and they create projects like that one, sometimes in interactive form, sometimes in a static form, and they call them data visualization, and they say that it's just for you to discover trends and patterns in the data. So I use just Ben Fry's example because it's a wonderful, beautiful example, but I see maps like that all the time. Taxi paths in New York City. That's another very famous one. I, I, I know that there are a lot of taxis around a Central Park in the middle of the day. That is not particularly insightful, right? I mean, it shows you something, but it's not particularly useful. So the key thing is, how could we make that piece of art, how, we can, can, how can we transform something that is already beautiful and attractive into something that doesn't stop being beautiful and attractive, but at the same time tells me something interesting? That is, I believe, the boundary, if you want to put it that way, it's a very fuzzy boundary, between data art and data visualization. Yeah. Yes, Isabel. Yeah, it could be. It is not the end point. It is, a, it is a process. It is a process. It's like a phase, as you said, a phase towards something different. And I believe that that something different is making those things useful, making those things, you know, informative. Mm -hmm. Yep, I also believe that it is a phase, yep. Uh, and as I said before, I see value in all the projects that I have shown so far in this presentation. I believe that they are all wonderful in their own sense, right? So I'm not trying to criticize them. I'm going to try just to show what I think we could do to make them perhaps a little bit better in the sense of informing readers, perhaps from a journalistic standpoint. I'm a little bit biased by that, by my background, I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
you can have a perspective, and you should, it, it is impossible not to have a perspective. I have my own political ideology. I'm a liberal. I can say that openly. Uh, well, actually, I was joking with about this the other day with a friend. I, I am considered a liberal here in the United States, but I am considered a hardcore conservative in Spain. That's how <laughs> things are <laughs> different in different countries. So I have my own views. No, I, I, I do believe in science. I do believe in evolution. It's not that I believe. I know that they are true. Uh, climate change, I don't know. I, I vote for liberal parties, so I have my own political opinions. But what I try to do actively is that I try to be, and I know how hard this sounds, but you have to make the effort, have to do the effort to, you know, test yourself sometimes. And testing yourself doesn't mean that you need to read or watch Fox News every single day. That is not what you need to do. You, do, you don't need to put two different things in the balance and then try to, try to find the middle point. It's, it's just a matter of thinking rationally about stuff and openly taking a look at the evidence that other people are providing about the topics that you are interested in. And then try to, you know, evaluate them somehow, either using common sense or using the scientific method if you are a scientist, or using data analysis if you are well versed in statistics and data analysis. Use the tools that you have in your hands. My core message is much more general than that. I am not a statistician, I am not a scienti scientist, I am just a journalist. But that is something that I do every single day. When I read a story in the New York Times, which is my paper, the paper that I receive every single day, a story that I'm interested in, I always try to challenge myself a little bit, all right? I don't just take things at face value, if possible. If I am in, in a rush, obviously, yes, I just read it and move away. But if it's about a topic that I'm interested in, I try to stop and, you know, double check their sources, for instance, or look for more data. Look for data or for evidence that could potentially contradict what you think about that topic. That is the general message. All right, well, thank you. <laughs>